afternoon, everybody. Um, Honourable Minister Maheen Kumar Saratun, distinguished guests, chamber members and friends, I hope you're all having a great day wherever you are. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome and thank you all for joining us today for what's going to be an, a really exceptional webinar. For those who I haven't met yet, my name is Julia Charlton. I'm the chair of the Commonwealth Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong. It's, it's slightly over a year since we set up the chamber and I'm delighted that we are able to be a hub and facilitator of important topics of debate across the Commonwealth, ranging from uh, legal arbitration to ecological urban development to intra-Commonwealth trade and development. And today, most excitingly, to hear all about Mauritius as a very important Commonwealth jurisdiction. Notwithstanding the difficulties of the past few years, which no nation in the world has been insulated from, Hong Kong remains a pivotal platform and information sharing hub for Commonwealth business individuals and entrepreneurs to collaborate and support each other in the development of mutually beneficial Commonwealth businesses, as well as to partake in necessary discourse and discussion and decision making on various topics and forums with great respect for each other's um, opinions and views. In Africa, Mauritius has made great strides in its economic development, business performance, political freedom and social stability. Over the years post-independence, the nation has paved a growth oriented development path and the success is evident. The 2021 Index of Economic Freedom by the Heritage Foundation ranked Mauritius first amongst all 47 countries of sub-Saharan Africa and 13th across the globe. And the world's 2020 Doing Business Report ranked the archipelago first regionally, the 13th worldwide for the 12th consecutive year in terms of overall ease of doing business. What an accolade. It's a flourishing financial hub, adept at providing state-of-the-art and globally competitive trade-related consulting, telecoms and financial services. From a helicopter view at my end, Hong Kong and Mauritius are congruent in their exceptional performance and have a, have a long and established history of strategic and economic cooperation. And the true potential of the two markets collaboration is perhaps yet to be realized. Hopefully we can change that. This would not be possible for us without the participation today of such exceptional speakers um, who are amongst the most capable to change the game for Mauritius and Hong Kong. So I'm so excited to hear their insights and proposals for further developments of trade relations. And as such, I would like them to take no, I'd like to take no further time away from them. I'd like to thank these speakers again for their attendance once more. And to move things along, I'll pass over to Andrew Wells, our Secretary General, who will be introducing our distinguished speakers and moderating this webinar. Andrew, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, many thanks to our Chairman, Julia Charlton, for her introduction to the Commonwealth Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong and to this very important event, Mauritius Investment Gateway to East Africa. I have been reminded by several participants that in a way our chosen title is a misnomer because of course Mauritius, apart from being a gateway to East Africa, is a gateway to many other parts of the continent. My name is Andrew Wells and I am Secretary General of the Commonwealth Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong. I'm delighted as moderator to have the honour to, to introduce our four extremely distinguished speakers. Our keynote speaker today is the Honourable Mahen Kumar Sirudun, Minister of Financial Services and Good Governance in Mauritius. Mr Sirudun has been an active public figure for many years in Mauritius and indeed well beyond. Uh, he was uh, elected to Mauritius's National Assembly in 2010 and since has served in many significant public sector posts, including on the Public Accounts Committee as Minister for Agro-Industry and Food Security, and now, of course, as Minister for Financial Services. But the Honourable Minister also has a wide and practical experience in the private sector. He's a professional accountant. He has a master's degree in business administration, and he has played a leading role both in the Mauritius sugar industry and in the CIL group of companies which will be familiar to many of our audience today. Our second speaker is Mr. Vini Goudier, the director of a director of Economic Development Board in Mauritius. For those in our Hong Kong audience, the EDB, as it's called, combines the roles in a way of Invest Hong Kong, the Trade Development Council, and the Trade and Industry Bureau here. Vinay has qualified himself for this by having 
eminent posts in the private sector in such conglomerates as Unilever, Maersk, and Coca-Cola, and now has the responsibility, the rather daunting responsibility, of being responsible for the investment promotion for the island, the economic diversification of Mauritius, but beyond that, supporting the transition of the whole African continent upwards along the global value chain. So we, Vinay, we're very happy to have you and we do look forward to your strategic insights into Mauritius's strategic role for all of us overseas. Our next two speakers will talk to us from a private sector perspective, one from the Mauritian side and one, so to speak, from the Hong Kong side. Ms. Yoshni Tulsi is the Assistant Head of International Banking at ABC Banking Corporation, which uh, has a major presence in Hong Kong. She's responsible herself for the development and strategy for the group's international business. And in the past, she has also worked in diverse players, such as Deutsche Bank, as well as the Cayman Islands and the United Kingdom. We look forward very much uh, Yoshni, to hear what you have to say about what Mauritius can offer to the private sector here. Finally, last but not least, we have Mr. Desmond Chu in Hong Kong. Mr. Chu is an entrepreneur who founded the Dynasty Group and has since then helped many Asian financial institutions to obtain investment dealer and investment banking licenses, as well, very importantly, uh, as opening bank accounts in Mauritius. We hope that um, he will also speak to us on the uh, 50th year of bilateral relations between Mauritius and China and the uh, business opportunities that may arise from the free trade agreement that was signed in 2001. So a big welcome to all these um, very special speakers. Without any further preliminaries, I invite with humility the minister to take the virtual floor. Well, thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for the kind introduction. And uh, to all participants, uh, very good morning to you all and good afternoon for those in the Far East. I must say I'm honored uh, to be here and to address you today. And I would like also first to thank uh, uh, and to express my gratitude to the organizers for inviting me to join you in this webinar. I mean, this webinar today, ladies and gentlemen, will go well in the context of the unflinching engagement of the Mauritius International Financial Center as a leading platform for trade, investment, and capital raising for the African region. The well-crafted agenda today takes purposeful strides in advancing the Mauritius for Africa agenda and raise our understanding of an important, important economic hotspot for Africa. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, at the helm of the Ministry of Financial Services, I would not have missed this opportunity to address you this morning. The COVID crisis is still lingering, has given away to the Ukraine crisis, while a low interest rate environment which have been shaping investment decisions for the past decade, have been compounded by galloping inflation. And now the question is, where do we go from here? Where do we turn if we want those good returns at the end of the day? Ladies and gentlemen, it is important to clarify that Mauritius has played an important role in driving impactful investment in Africa. As per the United States, United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD, World Investment Report 2019, published in 2019 itself, Mauritius has contributed its part to the roughly 46 billion US dollars worth of foreign direct investment flowing to Africa in 2018 an 11% increase compared to 2017. The report highlights the important role played by regional hubs like Mauritius in intra-regional investment flow. 
FDI stock from India, Malaysia, Singapore, South Africa, and Thailand to small island states, developing states, is almost all concentrated in Mauritius as a gateway to other African markets, especially East Africa. And we are here now to talk about Africa, right? So let's turn to the potentials of Africa for a moment. Africa's renewable energy opportunities are boundless, especially for solar, hydro, and geothermal energy sources. In terms of food safety as well, we must also look at the potential of Africa. The continent has around 65% of the uncultivated, rich, and fertile arable land to feed the world. Furthermore, Africa's population is set to rise to over 2 billion people by 2050. Consumer spending will reach 2.5 trillion US dollars by 2030, while business to business investments will reach over 3.5 trillion US dollars in the same period. Naturally, the world is shifting investment focus to Africa to tap into a booming consumer market where investments can find long-term value. Furthermore, in the context with our discussion today, it is important to, to note that East Africa is a region overflowing with potential from agriculture to mining, to tourism, to energy, investment opportunities abound. Also, it is expected that over the coming decades, Nigeria and East and other East African countries will perform particularly well. In this regard, ladies and gentlemen, you are in the right place to take the, convers the conversation forward, as Mauritius will certainly continue to play a decisive role and also an impactful, impactful one to unlock Africa's multi-billion dollar investment opportunities. Ladies and gentlemen, in August 2021, the Economic Development Board commissioned Capital Economics, a British consultancy firm, to conduct a study on the impact of investment routed from Mauritius. As per their findings, the Mauritius IFC is driving quality foreign direct investments into the continent. After India, Africa is actually the second largest destination for investment from Mauritius to in 82 billion US dollars. The investment from Mauritius into Africa represents 9% of overall foreign investment into the continent. The report further highlights significant investment from North America, Europe, and Asia, whereby Mauritius acts as an important channel for investment flowing into all regions of Africa. The exercise conducted by Capital Economics suggests that currently the largest beneficiaries are East and West Africa, followed by Southern African countries, excluding South Africa, which have stocks of inward investment of 21 billion US dollars, 16 billion US dollars, and 12 billion US dollars respectively that have facilitated by Mauritius. Furthermore, in East and West Africa, Mauritius is responsible for 10% of each of their total FDI and portfolio investment stock. As you may observe, East Africa is certainly the largest destination for investment. Ladies and gentlemen, according to a capital economics report, the annual flow of investment from Mauritius has been increasingly quick. quick. And there's no doubt Africa is growing is a growing market for Mauritius, but the potential for growth across Africa 
with the value between countries. Those with good institutions, strong infrastructure, and proximity to major economic centers would be able to grow at a faster rate. Investment into East Africa over the past decade has increased by 29%. Ladies and gentlemen, Mauritius for Africa will continue to fulfill its promise by delivering on the Africa we want as envisioned in the African Union Commission's 2063 agenda. To promote prosperity and development in Africa and ensure that sustainable development goals are met, there needs to be a focus on stimulating foreign investment into the continent, where there is a need to finance around $700 billion per year. Ladies and gentlemen, I can assure you that the commitment to more responsible investment is central to my ministry's objectives going forward. We are embedding environmental, social, and governance thinking in our policy decisions to create a more sustainable environment for investments to happen. My ministry, in tandem with the National Committee on Corporate Governance, is working on an ESG framework to achieve our vision of continued improvement in ESG performance. We are working to give the comfort to investors that funds channels from Mauritius into Africa come with sustainability credentials. Ladies and gentlemen, I take the opportunity of this forum to invite you all to come and do business with Mauritius. The Mauritius brand is now a mature, a mature IFC, which ticks all the boxes from an investor's perspective. As I mentioned earlier, Mauritius is used as a platform of choice for onward investment across the African continent. Investors come our way with the reassurance that they are entering a credible and clean jurisdiction offering end-to-end -end solutions to clients. Mauritius offers a seamless service to Mauritius domicile and foreign structures. Mauritius now has a robust and modern AML CFT framework, which adheres to the highest standards when compared to other highly developed IFCs. Furthermore, Mauritius is compliant with the OECD standards and has no harmful tax regimes, thus putting the country at a level playing field with other reputable IFCs. For all these reasons and many more, we are confident to see the continued use of the jurisdiction by fund managers and, invest and investors to invest into Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to draw your attention to our, on our reputation as a fund jurisdiction. Mauritius has a robust fund framework. Our fund administrators provide a strong middle office along with enhanced investor reporting solutions to fund managers. These fund managers are now increasingly using our jurisdiction as an efficient administration, accounting, and back office solution to the serving of funds domiciled in other countries. Furthermore, the breadth of our product offerings which we are constantly innovating in terms of responsiveness adds to the complete, completeness of our ecosystem being made available to fund managers for an efficient structuring of their businesses. We have introduced new activities for regional headquarters and fund and asset management with the introduction of a special tax regimes. More recently, we have launched a new product, the Variable Capital Companies, which is an attractive structure for various types of funds. Ladies and gentlemen, 
as Minister of Financial Services, responsible for the global business sector. I can assure you that I will continue to do all I can to support sustainable investments channeled through our jurisdiction into Africa. And the Motion government stands ready to work with, with each one of you. So I welcome you anytime to Mauritius, and we are here open to talk and to discuss. So with these words, I thank you for your kind attention, and I hand over the mic back to you, Andrew. Thanks. Thank you very much, Minister. That was a tour de force of a presentation. Certainly, um, I hadn't realized the FDI figures in particular. I'm sure we're all looking forward to diversify, if we haven't already done so, into Mauritius, uh, having heard what you've said. I'm sorry you have to leave us now, but believe us, we will be in touch, possibly in person, in your island quite soon. May I now ask um, our ne next speaker, uh, Mr. Vinay Goudier, to take the floor. Thank you, Andrew, uh, Honourable Minister, uh, Chairperson, Julia, uh, and uh, Secretary General, Andrew, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, it's truly a, an honour and a pleasure to be here with you today and talking to the Commonwealth Chamber uh, for Hong Kong. And uh, basically, I would be substantiating uh, part of what the Minister has been saying in the presentation. Uh, I do believe that uh, somebody's going to move this slide, so we can go to the next slide, please. Right, so um, my first uh, point, my first slide is about uh, Mauritius, just introducing a little bit about Mauritian jurisdiction to those who don't know about Mauritius. We got independence back in 1968, which is about 54 years ago. And at that time, Mauritius was a poor uh, island state nation uh, with a GDP per capita of uh, $400 at that time. So uh, not many people gave Mauritius a true chance to be successful in reality. And uh, if you look at Nobel Prize winners like Jane Mead and Bear Snipo, uh, who described Mauritius basically as a lost cause. But certainly uh, the island nation of Mauritius, which doesn't have any natural resources, and it's far away from its major market, being a small island developing state, um, banked on the excellent governance, on um, its political stability, and also on the social stability that the, that the island had, and a lot on educating the, the population. And slowly but surely we went up through uh, economic diversification of the country. So I'll take you a little bit for the economic journey of Mauritius here. So back in 1968, Mauritius was what well, an agricultural economy. 80% of the GDP was around primary sector agriculture, which was mainly the cane industry, which was 75% of the GDP at that time, which was cane. And then in the early 70s, uh, we moved into a, an ex, uh, import export import substitution strategy where the Mauritius embarked in the industri industrialization of the island. So export processing zones uh, were created across the island where uh, the rapid industrialization process started to limit the importation, reduce the trade deficit. And at the same time, we embraced textile technology in Mauritius and through the textile industry, uh, the GDP per capita went up, as you can see uh, already, uh, in the mid-80s, it was over $1,000 per GDP. Then in the early 80s, it was about the development of the hospitality and tourism sector, and that helped Mauritius to move up the ladder, and you will see in the 1990s, we were around $2,400 per, per uh, GDP per capita. In early 1990s, more specifically in 1992, uh, and, and this is 30 years of the financial sector in Mauritius, so the, the financial industry was set up in 1992. Um, at that time, in 1991, the Mauritius signed it to India, and that was basically the base of setting up the financial sector and the global business sector in Mauritius. And you can see the rapid expansion in the 1990s to the, to the 2000s, where the GDP per capita went up to about $8,000. In the early 2000s, it was about the ICT sector that was launched, and uh, the technology, the back processing of uh, outsourcing uh, services that was launched at that time. And again, it took us uh, to where we reached just before COVID, Mauritius was officially a high income economy at $12,350 per capita income. Unfortunately, 
in 2020, after 37 years of continuous economic growth, Mauritius experienced its first economic uh, contraction in 2020 due to COVID, and it was a massive one. It was a negative 15% economic contraction. Why? Because we closed over borders and we had no tourists for two years. And you can imagine for an economy where 15% of the GDP was on tourism and we lost that revenue for a full year. Lessons learned, we are putting into place uh, new measures to make sure that we are more res resilient going forward. But the good thing is the Mauritian GDP growth is the perfect V-shape that economists would like to see because we dipped by 15%. Next year, we grew up by 5%. This year, we expected to grow by another 7.2%. And from there onwards, it's going to be positive 5% growth for the next three to four years at least. Uh, we're looking at to 2020, it is going to be again positive GDP growth for the Mauritian economy. Next slide, please. Right, so uh, we go to the next slide. So the next slide is a little bit a summary of uh, accolades we heard uh, uh, previously, uh, the chairperson and uh, Andrew and also the minister talk about the accolades. This is important because whenever somebody wants to consider why Mauritius, and, and, the, and the, the key aspect is that you want to look at the jurisdiction, especially when you're looking at Africa, you want to mitigate risk. And now when you talk to global CEOs, they will tell you, you know, if, if Africa embraced good governance, they will readily invest in Africa. Why? Because IMF has said that uh, Africa is where China was 30 years ago and where India was 20 years ago. What they mean by that is that 30 years ago, uh, China ex experienced rapid, uh, started to experience its rapid growth, economic growth uh, in, in, in the early, in the late 1980s and early 1990s, while India in the early 1990s and late 1990s experienced its rapid growth. And according to the IMF, Africa is actually at the dawn of its rapid economic expansion. Why? I will just share with you why, because Africa is 17% of the world population, the fastest growing demography in the world, expected to reach 2.5 billion by 2050. And currently over 60% of the population is under, under the age of 25. So it's a young population uh, that is there waiting for us to expand economically. Number two, Africa is home to 30% of the world global minerals reserves, whether it's about petrol, whether it's about diamond, whether it's about coal, whether it's about carbon, or whether it's about uh, iron, 30% of the global mineral reserves of the world is in the African continent. Number three, Africa is home to 60% of untapped arable land in the world. I'm, told, I'm saying here untapped arable land. And when you look at the report from the FAO, Food Agricultural Organization, they tell you that the food production from now to 2050 has to grow by at least 50% to meet the demand of the world by 2050. And you can bet where the bulk of that food production uh, growth is going to come from in the 60% untapped arable land in the continent. So we have the resources, which is, which is not cost, costly. We have the natural, we have the human resource, we have the natural resource, we got the land. So when you put that all together, it is for us, we can't understand why Africa today only represents 2.6% of global trade and attracts around 3% of global FTI. Uh, I know last year, Africa had a very big FTI uh, uh, that came to, to, to the African continent, about 82 billion, but 40 billion is on one project to South Africa. So in general, Africa has been averaging about 40 to $45 billion as FTI annually. Now, the IMF tells you that there's a gap, there's a finance gap of about $150 billion to $170 billion annually to finance projects on the African continent. Now, this gap, this is where Mauritius wants to fill in. After having spent the first 20 to 25 years of its, uh, of its journey, the Mauritius IFC has structured around $190 billion to India as FTI. Today, the same expertise that has been acquired over the past three decades is being put to structure funds, the finance project across the African continent. And today, the minister already mentioned, Capital Economics did a survey for us last year, and they showed that $82 billion has already been structured to the African continent for the Mauritius Ives. Now, why Mauritius? Because Mauritius is perceived to be an ideal intermediary jurisdiction for the African continent because it's a jurisdiction that can mitigate the risk and make the investment viable on the African 
continent. The reason is what you are seeing on the board is all the accolades were first in Africa, and in most of them, we are top in the globe as well as, as one of the key uh, jurisdictions uh, to do business. And also, if you talk about our hybrid legal system, where in Mauritius, for, for the past 210 years, there we used to be a French colony uh, in the 16th, 17th century, and in 1810, we became a British colony, and the British maintained the Code Civil, the French Napoleon law, and this has been a hybrid legal system in Mauritius for the past 210 years. I don't think there's another, another jurisdiction in the world that has mastered both legal system the way that Mauritius has. And that is a strength because Africa is divided into Francophone and, and Anglophone Africa. And through Mauritius, it helps you to drive investment into these uh, countries. Currently, we're developing the arbitration centers. We got the, we got the, uh, uh, we already have a code of arbitration in Mauritius. We, we got two arbitration centers. But other than that, we also now diversifying into other services, including intellectual property and, 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 and trade financing and so on. So the minister already mentioned uh, in the budget re uh, recently, we also introduced a reinsurance uh, service for the Mauritian jurisdiction for the African continent. So all these uh, put together, we gearing up to try and help Africa go up the value chain, embrace its industrialization process at the same time uh, to, to really uh, deliver on its promise. Yes, next slide, please. So quickly, uh, this is what the minister mentioned earlier, uh, where funds are being structured through the Mauritius IFC to different parts of the world. As you can see, uh, India is still very important for us, but Africa is growing very, very fast. And then we have Europe, America, so it's all across the globe. It's not just on the Mauritian, not just on Africa, not just in India, but it's all across the globe. So the Mauritius Africa, uh, IFC is certainly picking a momentum uh, as we can see from the figures of this board. Next slide, please. Right, so this is just a summary of how the funds are structured into Africa. So the value to Africa, the asset in the administration to the African continent structure through the Mauritian IFC currently stands at 82 billion. And you can see, as the minister said, most of it is structured in the southern part, South Africa, of course, being the biggest economy of the African continent and Nigeria as well, the most populated country in Africa, certainly attracting most of the investment. But what I can tell you is according to the same uh, study, uh, these investments uh, have created some 4 million jobs on the African continent for the past 15 years. Next. Right, so just to sum up, uh, because I'm trying to keep it short so I can answer questions. So just to sum up, 30% of the earth minerals resources. Uh, if you look at Africa, what does it need? Uh, for, from now to 2050, according to the African Union architects, Africa needs 700 million houses. If you divide that, that's about 50,000 housing units per day. Now, why uh, this, this program is important? Because if you think about the whole of Africa, only have 55,000 qualified architects. That tells you one architect has to build one house every day to deliver on the promise of Africa. So it shows you about the enormous work ahead of us and why Africa needs IFCs like Mauritius to aggressively promote funds to finance projects on the continent. We talk about the population, we talk about the arable land, we talk about uh, the the, the, the funding uh, that is required, according to the AFDB here, 130 to 170 billion dollars annually, and also uh, I see there is the consumer spending, of course, which is rising quite fast with the growing middle class in in Africa. Just to close, we've seen there's one thing that I want to 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 everybody to to consider. We talk about Mauritius diversifying, growing. Uh, we've been resilient past of it. We've been experiencing severe uh, 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 constraints in the past two years. We've been uh, graylisted by the FATF and we got out of it in record times. And all these shows the resilience of the Mauritian jurisdiction at the same time. And through all these experience, we've acquired learnings uh, that we are now moving forward. I can tell you, we are not reactive in a proactive way. If you look at the previous finance bill that has just been voted at the National Assembly of Mauritius, we already putting into our framework the global minimum tax that is going to that is expected to come in the next three to four years. We're not implementing it, but we're starting to uh, how do you call it domesticate the thinking of the global minimum minimum tax. We don't 
get taken by surprise again and fall back and be brainstormed again by the FATF. So this is the lessons that Mauritius has learned. How do we adapt with the dynamic global legal requirements and also with, with the fast growing internet and, and FinTech and, and all these technologies we cannot just rest on our laurels now that we are properly whitelisted and meet all the jurisdiction, all the uh, requirements by the OECD, by the EU, and by the FATF. It's about adapting and it's about continuously improving to make sure that we deliver the at the highest efficiency, highest effectiveness, but also with regards and respecting all the norms and expectations of the global bodies at the same time. So we want. Our ambition is to create that jurisdiction, that intermediary jurisdiction of trust that will mitigate your risk so that your investment, not just in Africa, but across the globe, is done in a fast, in an effective, in a cost-effective manner, but also in a trusted and reliable jurisdiction. That's where we want to go. That's where we want to position Mauritius. And I hope that I've been able to share in that seven, eight minutes what, what a summary of Mauritius and supporting the minister's uh, statement earlier. And I'm looking forward to your questions for Tom. Thank you, Andrew. Back to you. Thank you very much indeed, Vinay, for that comprehensive and passionate explanation, exegesis on what Mauritius has to offer strategically. And as you say, I'm sure that a lot of those points will be taken up in Q&A. Uh, given the time constraints, I want to hand over the floor as quickly as possible to the next speaker, uh, Ms. Uh, Yoshni Tosi. Yoshni, over to you. Thank you, Andrew. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you once again, Andrew, for the introduction and for having me in today's session. I'm really pleased to, to talk about Mauritius uh, being the gateway for cross borders. And I'm going to be a little bit quick because I know we're running out of time, but I will try to make it as precise and, and concise for all our audience here. So, um, Julia, can we go to the first slide, please? Thank you. So, okay, so uh, Mauritius has always remained the preferred jurisdiction for Africa. I mean, everyone knows that. And our jurisdiction combines beautifully the advantage of an offshore financial sector with the advantage of network and treaties and double agreement. And I think um, Vinay has gone through that into details on why to choose Mauritius. And uh, on this slide, you will see a summary of of uh, why we need to, to choose Mauritius as jurisdiction to do business. So one of the key points would be no capital gain tax, dividend and interest rewarding tax or share transfer, a flat corporate and income tax rate of 15% and no estate duty, inheritance or wealth tax. Or you can also um, see that we have a very efficient port with deep water quay and a very high net bandwidth connectivity with Europe, Asia and Africa. So um, just just so that you know, we have we have a very skilled uh, workforce and accountant, and um, ABC Banking uh, has been here for uh, nearly twelve years now, and we have been um, you know focusing on the international uh, offshore accounts. So uh, we have two representative offices in Hong Kong and Dubai, uh, facilitating for opening um, accounts here in Mauritius. The head office is found in Mauritius. So we open all types of accounts being individual, corporate, trust, fund, and foundations. We also open um, for different entities, that is in Singapore, Hong Kong, Seychelles, BVI, and elsewhere in the world. So the uh, various activities which are accepted at ABC Banking is the holding and investment companies, trading and commercial business. So uh, we try to to support fully what the government of Mauritius is doing and EDB to promote uh, Mauritius as a gateway to Africa. And we try to make sure that we, we facilitate those account opening as fast as we can. So can we go to the next slide, Julia, please? Thank you. So in terms of, um, in terms of skill a uh, workforce, uh, you, you must know that Mauritius has always been uh, having a professional um, skill workforce here, and we have been dealing with modern international science requirements. We're also bilingual, speaking uh, fluent English and French, breaking all communication uh, 
barriers. So the level of service in bushes is, is very fast and efficient, and we have a very hardworking culture. So uh, can we just go to the next slide as well, Julia? So I would go. Um, so I would go quickly uh, in terms of advantages of opening account in uh, with ABC Banking. So we open all types of account, being a USD, Euro, pound sterling, and uh, HKD. So we have internet banking uh, free of charge and a debit card which is linked directly to your account. We have a dedicated team for your uh, accounting requirements, for your banking requirements. We can offer a very competitive effect uh, rate and fixed deposit um, rates as well. And we can do international remittances in more than 100 uh, currencies. So that's a little bit about ABC banking. I would skip uh, all two slides because Andrew is looking at me and uh, you know looking at the, at the time as well. And so I don't want to keep everyone waiting. So yeah, that should be it for me. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Yashni. I It wasn't that I wanted to keep you strictly to time. I, it was merely that I wanted to uh, give Desmond his opportunity to tell the story from a Hong Kong perspective. Desmond. Thank you, Andrew. I believe we have uh, my slides up as well. Brilliant, next slide, please. So as a uh, Mauritian Chinese who has done quite a bit of work in this area, um, I think the best um, way to explain the relationship between Hong Kong, Mauritius and China is really the um, headline articles that appeared in the National Day insert. Um, just as Hong Kong has played such an important role in terms of foreign investment into China, and Mauritius, of course, playing a similar role into Africa, I believe time has come for Hong Kong and Mauritius together to play the role of Chinese investments into Africa and vice versa. I believe the synergies are there, not only from a cultural, from a language, but I think most important from the trust that's been developed between the two um, countries. So if we go to the next slide, um, you'll see that the timing of um, this is extremely important because 2022 actually marks the 50 years of bilateral relationship between Mauritius and China. Um, being one of the first African countries to actually recognize the Chinese government, uh, Mauritius has always been on the high list of um, relationships by the Chinese government. Um, back in 2018, when President Xi visited, it was actually on the last of his five country uh, tour, and that was reciprocated by the Mauritian PM's visit uh, later in the year. And as you can see, um, there have been a number of initiatives, whether it's the regional headquarters, the global treasury, or even the recently ratified free trade agreement, um, Mauritius always comes up with very attractive incentives and propositions for investors to look into the African region. Um, I think a number of the other speakers have already spoken about the financial hub, so I'll skip that. Next slide, please. We talked quite a bit about the um, repositioning of Mauritius into a financial and logistics hub. In particular, the recently ratified FTA, um, as you can see here, uh, see here, it's actually opened up Mauritius um, to 130 subsectors to Chinese investment across multiple sectors. So for those of us in the audience that might be interested, it includes everything from communications, education, finance, tourism, culture, and even traditional Chinese medicine. Um, is included. So uh, for those that want to know more about the FTA, I'm happy to answer questions uh, later. Next slide. One of the key things that I think is interesting to consider um, when we look at the final frontier, um, which is of course Africa, is that it's more than investments into mining and infrastructure. There are actually many, many soft infrastructure plays, whether it's in the areas of fintech, technology, uh, capital raising, or even blockchain. Um, and as you can see from the next slide, um, I've actually um, got two case studies that I'll quickly share with everyone here. One of the companies that we have taken into Mauritius is a Hong Kong and Cyprus regulated financial group called uh, KAB Group. They've actually recently set up their investment dealer license in Mauritius with the view of attracting high net worth Chinese monies um, using Mauritius, of course, as the hub. Um, we see more and more of these um, non-banking financial institutions being set up in Mauritius and, of course, using that as a platform for further investments into Africa. 
The next client is actually one that has put together a co-working space. This is particularly interesting because as more and more Chinese investors look to position themselves into Africa, they are seeing the, um, the stability and a lot of the other factors that was mentioned earlier um, using Mauritius as their um, hub into Africa. Next slide. Um, moving forward, there are also new um, opportunities. Uh, recently, the FSC of Mauritius has launched what is known as the VASP, the Virtual Asset Service Provider Regime. So for those of us in the audience that might be interested, um, a number of the crypto-related licenses, whether it's the broker-dealer license, uh, which of course allows for OTC desk to carry out activities, all the way to a class S, which would be a full-blown exchange license, similar to that of, of a Binance. Um, those VASP licenses are now available. And of course, com coming with these licenses would be um, the banking infrastructure that would facilitate the off-ramping of such digital assets. The other area that I believe um, bodes a lot of potential is in the area of virtual exhibition centers. I think earlier in the seminar, we have heard speakers talk about the growing trade and the importance of um, the China-Africa trade window, and therefore positioning Mauritius and other African Indian Ocean economies as those exhibition centers, particularly from uh, using the metaverse, um, I think is uh, going to bode well. And so um, I believe we've spoken about a lot of interesting areas uh, for future growth. But a lot of people ask, Desmond, given that you, you have done quite a bit of work in this area, um, what has inspired you to, to do so? So if we could perhaps go to my last uh, slide. This is just to share that a lot of the inspiration has come from my late grandfather, Sir Jean Chuen. Um, he actually appear, appears on the currently circulated uh, 25 rupee bill. Um, he was instrumental in creating a lot of the uh, early contributions of the Chinese community into Mauritius. Um, an earlier speaker mentioned about the development of the EPZ. He was actually uh, one of the key um, leaders that brought the Chinese and Taiwanese investors. So it is under um, a lot of the previous work done by my grandfather that really has inspired me uh, to continue that work and hopefully in conjunction with efforts by the Commonwealth Chamber, we look forward to inviting many of you in the audience to join us in Mauritius in person and explore the opportunities at hand. Back to you, Andrew. Desmond, thank you very much. If there was ever a marvelous combination of tradition and the present practicalities and the future, that I think was it. Now, before I uh, go straight to Q&A, can I uh, remind the audience, which actually is quite a substantial one, uh, please do type your questions in. I have received a few um, and uh, I'd like to receive a lot more because I'm sure you'd all agree that what we've been offered today has been um, a uh, Gallimalfrey of, of public and private sector views, looking at it both from a, a, a Mauritian, a Hong Kong, a Chinese, an African, and indeed an international perspective. Uh, while I wait for those additional questions to come in, um, perhaps I'll, I'll use moderator's privilege to ask a couple of my own. Uh, the minister and also um, Vinay referred to the or in Vinay in particular, to the common law and French civil law tradition in Mauritius. Um, being Anglo-French myself, this is fascinating to me. I'd like to ask uh, Vinay, um, but others please contribute, how do you consider that this common law and French civil law uh, tradition uh, complements or complicates itself in the Mauritian legal context? I mean, there have been cases, I mean, uh, Vanuatu is one where the two systems didn't work entirely well together. So what would you say on, on, on that? What is, is it an attraction or is it a distraction? Uh, Andrew, uh, thank you. Thank you for this question. Uh, from, from our perspective, it's a strength uh, for Mauritius. Uh, it is an attraction uh, because in this world today where you're trying to, especially uh, across the globe and even in Africa, uh, when you're trying to, to really do business globally, it's important to grasp the key law for grasp the key laws from all other countries. And, and having a good understanding of both the, the, the French code, civil code, and the British common law, uh, certainly uh, all goes well for a jurisdiction like Mauritius. I can tell you uh, why it works well in Mauritius, because we have man managed to find a niche after, I'll say, 210 years of practicing both 
uh, next to each other. And of course, what you will find is that the British common law is used in all the commercial aspect of uh, all the common law, you know, all, all the everything that we do is, is based, the British, the Mauritius constitution is mainly uh, adapted from the British constitution at the end of the day. So the British common law is widely used across Mauritius and it's used to, to structure uh, almost everything that we see. And the French code, the French civil code is used mainly uh, whenever there is an asset uh, acquisition of immovable property assets. That's where the, we found that the French civil law is much better structured for that. And you will find that when you have to go to notary and you have to, 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 to do any transaction with regards to recording your property or, tra or transferring your property, this will be done based on the French civil law in Mauritius. And, and because what they have done over, over 210 years, they have certainly uh, identified the strength of the common law and the strength of the civil law. And that's what they have in Mauritius, a hybrid legal system where you have almost 80% of what we do is around the British common law and the 20% about asset property acquisition is around the French civil law, basically. And, and you will find that when it comes to succession planning and everything, the French civil law is very, very in detail and structured to that. So we've taken the best of both worlds, put it together, and it gives us also the ability to look at observing uh, different jurisdictions from the Mauritian jurisdiction. Today, when we have arbitration court, we can do it both uh, in the British common law or in the French civil uh, civil uh, law uh, uh, regime. So, so that certainly all goes well and gives us that certain uh, flexibility uh, that other jurisdiction doesn't have. Uh, certainly, uh, for some people, it might may sound com uh, complex and confusing. I'm not a legal person myself, so maybe my answer is limited there. But, but certainly, when I do speak to to all the legal firms that are using Mauritius for structuring investment overseas. They tell me it is something that they use to promote themselves and it works quite well uh, because it is attractive at the end of the day. Merci bien. Tu t'avais d'accord uh, con vous et con monsieur le ministre. Um, the, the second question that I have um, is this, and it is perhaps directed best at Yoshni, I think. Um, what, looking forward, do you think is the future for Mauritian financial institutions? Of course, you've got a vested interest, ABC, but let's say in general, in Hong Kong specifically. Okay, so um, so basically, um, I think, like I said, and like Vinay, Vinay already described it, that Mauritius has always been, um, you know, a favorite jurisdiction and preferred jurisdiction uh, for um, you know, people in Hong, from Hong Kong to investing in Africa. So um, we we have a very skilled workforce. We we have a very uh, well structured uh, framework um, in in Mauritius in terms of uh, our banking institution, our financial institution. So um, to really invest in, in Mauritius, it's not going to be a, a real problem for Hong Kong investors then. Thank you, Oshni. And I do have also a question for Desmond here. Um, you've, you have, as they say, been about a bit, um, and you know the Mauritian and the Hong Kong and the mainland China and the African market well. So from a Hong Kong and greater China perspective, um, if you were had to sum it up quickly, what would be your key frustrations and also key successes or happinesses, shall we say, in working with Mauritius from here? So let's start with always the pluses, which is, um, I think, the fact that there is such affinity between Mauritius and China. Um, it goes to show that um, even with this 50 year bilateral relationship, um, I think Mauritius is the first African country to actually get this um, special arrangement. And it also means that there's gonna be much more Chinese investment coming through the way of Africa. And of course done so via Mauritius. So in that respect, I think the plus is the affinity of the two countries. Um, I wouldn't say there are necessarily many minuses. Um, I think the pace of um, work, uh, certainly in Hong Kong where we tend to work um, um, 16 hour days um, in Mauritius. Um, I don't believe we do work 16 hour days, but that's also the plus of Mauritius where you 
work hard, you also play hard. And that's why people in Mauritius tend to live a lot longer. Back to you, Andrew. Thank you. Uh, actually, Hong Kong has the, the highest longevity of any place, any jurisdiction in the world, not excluding Japan, despite the work hard, play hard ethic, but we'll let that pass. Um, that's a good answer. Uh, I would now um, like to uh, put a question to you. Um, I'm not sure to which uh, of our panelists, but I've had a question in from one of our uh, CCC advisors, Mr. Johnny Carmichael, and he says, it was very encouraging to hear from the minister of the high quality ESG framework that is being developed in Mauritius. Uh, Africa is at a crucial uh, development crossroads whereby unsustainable development could result in systemic environmental crises. So for that reason, could we hear a little bit more about the rush for channeling investment into Africa through Mauritius will ensure that um, we do not exploit untapped natural uh, reserves such as arable land and mineral resources in a negative way. Uh, maybe, I, I, I'm not sure, maybe Vinay take that first and um, anybody else would be uh, welcome to comment. Yeah, thank, thanks, Andrew. Uh, certainly this, this is, uh, you, you will find that most of the funds, most of the, of the uh, companies or investment going into Africa they, will, uh, they, will, they are all aiming at meeting the SDGs uh, for, for uh, the UN SDGs. And also it's a lot of compact investment is being structured for Mauritius. And to date, we already have two green bonds uh, that, uh, that Mauritius has set up for investing uh, on the African continent. So certainly, uh, uh, and we want to turn Mauritius as, as one of the key IFC in the world that is aggressively promoting uh, green bonds and green investment, and more specifically to the African continent. As I said earlier, Africa is going to embark in, in its industrialization process, and we have a chance to get it right, get it right the first time, get it right on a people, Point of view, get it right on, on a social point of view, get it right on an environmental point of view, and get it right on a technical technological point of view as well for adopting Industry 4.0, artificial intelligence, uh, to make sure that there is no uh, waste and there is no, uh, it, whatever we do, we ha it has to meet the sustainable development, because what we want to do is creating jobs, creating value addition for the African continent over the long term, not destroying value. The value of Africa right now is its nature, it's its uh, human resource, and we cannot destroy that. And that's where most investments are geared towards. Of course, there's a balance. There's a lot of investment on, on asset, on mining, for example, which is, which is uh, certainly, uh, if you're going to mine, you, you, you will have to be selective which part of Africa that you can do mining, you can do agriculture, but which part you have to protect and preserve at the same time. So there's a lot of work being done. There's frameworks, the high fives of the AFDD, and every fund structured into the African continent has to go and respect all these high fives and these teaching goals at the same time. And as I told you, we are working hard to turn Mauritius as a green fund IFC for not just the country, for the globe as well. Thank you, Vinay. Um we're nearly running out of time. Um, we're lucky enough uh, today to have our distinguished chairperson, uh, Julia Charlton here, uh, not only as organizer, but also as participant. May I ask whether, Julia, you have any questions you'd like to put to this interesting group of people? Um, I have loads of questions. I know, so do I. I was, <laughs> uh, Perhaps I could ask um, the uh, the director, first of all, um, I was wondering what the thinking was behind the whole VASP regime. Are you seeing that as being mm -hmm. a new source of um, business and development for Mauritius? Are you talking about the virtual assets? Yes, yes. Yeah, certainly. Uh, thank you, Julia. I think this is uh, one of the latest uh, uh, developments in the Mauritius IFC, uh, the VASP or the VITOS Act, as we call it in Mauritius. Uh, Desmond clearly went over the five different uh, uh, f uh, licenses that you can get, and it's called Morris, by the way, M-O-R-I-S, so which is Mauritius in Creole. And, and, and basically what we want to do is, we all talking about cryptocurrency, we're talking about Bitcoin, we're talking about fintech. And uh, what we wanted to do, we wanted to be in Africa and this part of the world to be the first jurisdiction that has a proper uh, uh, set of policy and guideline that could validate the work of what the new 
innovators, investors are doing in the fintech industry. So this is exactly what we have put into place now, which gives a real, uh, uh, how do you say, substance to the work that these uh, creatives are, are doing in the financial, in the fintech industry. So we want Mauritius to, to move ahead and be the first mover when it comes to, to really developing disruptive innovation tools and services, not just for the African continent, but the world. And why? Because we believe Africa is the cradle of, of fintech with, with M-Pesa, which was created more, uh, almost uh, 15 years ago, uh, which is the mobile payment system, which was first introduced in Africa. So we believe like because Africa, there's a lack of real service, uh, a real lack of technology at that time. And when you look at the penetration of banking in Africa, it's less than 20%. The penetration of insurance service is 3.65% of the African continent. So certainly uh, the, the FinTech tools and technologies are going to do well in the, in the African context and could then be replicated in other parts of the world. So this is where Mauritius is positioning itself as a platform to nurture these ideas and innovations. Wow, that's um, extremely exciting. And it looks to me that like that regime is based on the FATF guidelines. It looks to me, looks pretty compliant. Yeah, yeah. Certainly, yeah. certainly. And, and that's why, along with that, we also introduced the potential domestication of the global minimum tax, because we don't want them, we don't want in the future to say, right, you have this, but you, there's this global standard that you need to meet. So we already yeah. starting to engage and make sure when we do it, we get it right first time and not have stop start uh, uh, experiences, basically. Right, and a very quick question, if I may, for um, Yoshni. Um, thank you very much, uh, Director. Um, I just wondered, Yoshni, how digitalized is ABC Bank, and how digitalized is the um, banking sector in Mauritius generally? Perhaps you could just comment on that, please. Of course, um, Juliet. Um, you know, with ABC Banking, we've just uh, upgraded our internet banking platform, which is free of charge. So you you can do um, international payments anywhere in the world, of course, except from the sanctioned countries. And we are also uh, working closely with uh, Central Bank of Mauritius for e e signature and. Uh, in act, uh, you know, to accept a uh, signature because before it was an issue, they needed the signature to be in ink. But um, thankful to uh, Central Bank of Mauritius and with COVID, that realized that a e signature is is something that is important and should be uh, legalized. Um, and this is a very interesting features for our clients uh, international, where they do not have to come to Mauritius or to the bank to uh, open accounts. So uh, it gave us a huge advantage compared to banks in Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, which needs their, or even in Dubai, which needs their, their clients to be uh, present in, in um, you know, uh, physically there to open the account. Um, and in terms of digitalization at ABC Banking, we're working on uh, different projects here where we can do onboarding of, of clients uh, directly on, on a platform a mobile platform or mobile app where they can do it by themselves and we we you know stop the paperwork and back and forth emails so uh, that will also be benefit because uh, i know that lots of clients complain about the opening of the account taking too too long like uh, three four weeks and um, it's all about the miscommunication but if they can do it uh with at their ease on their time uh, on their mobile mobile app then that should solve the issues. Wow, that's impressively joined up thinking with, with both your bank and government on the e-signature in particular. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Yoshni and, and Julia. Um, I was originally going to pose a, a final question, but I have had a much better one uh, put to me by an anonymous uh, panelist, uh, sorry, attendee. So I'd like to ask this question. What advice would you give someone looking to visit Mauritius for the first time? And how would that advice change if someone wanted to invest in property there? Um, I'd like to ask all the panelists for a very quick take on that, starting with Desmond, please. So for anybody looking to come to Mauritius, my first point of advice is come see me uh, because I can probably <laughs> answer all of your questions. You're in Hong Kong. I am in Hong Kong, but I think that the fact is um, property is something that um, uh, is potentially restrictive to foreign investment, depending on uh, what level of, um, you know, 
well, first of all, what structure they come in with. Um, I think the, the government has a number of policies that they're opening up now, especially some of those linked to residency permits. But um, rather than go through lengthy discussions for anybody interested in making such investments, uh, I'm sure both the EDB and private sector would welcome them with open arms. Um, Andrew. Yeah. Yes. Thank, uh, would, thank, um, thank you, Andrew. Would, yes. Would, would you would, like a comment, uh, Vinay? Yeah, I would like to opinion? compliment that because there's some changes uh, which has been brought during the COVID time, and, and, and I think Desmond will be very happy to hear that. Uh, recently, uh, through the finance bill uh, that came into force uh, two weeks ago, uh, you any any foreigner can purchase property in Mauritius to the value of $350,000. Uh, they will have to, to pay, uh, they will have to add 10% of that value to a fund in Mauritius, but that will give you uh, ownership, full ownership of your property, and that will give you access to a 10-year resident permit in Mauritius as well. And you can visit Mauritius, uh, uh, you know, like in terms of uh, on a tourist visa, I think uh, most of the world, 98% uh, of the countries of the world, have, you don't need a visa to come to Mauritius. Uh, there are a few restricted countries, of course. I don't. Uh, I know Hong Kong and China is not part of that restricted countries. Um, another thing is, if you want to come and really try Mauritius as a place to work, you can also. There's a new premium visa that has been launched. It's totally free. It's valid for a year. You can come and do whatever you want. You can even work. You don't need a license. You need a permit, and you can just experience Mauritius. And if you are happy, you want to eventually move your office, your family, or you want to acquire property in Mauritius. Uh, then you make your choice and it's flexible. We can change it to a resident permit. We can change it to an investor permit. Investor permit. We can change it to any permit over the course of the 12 years. So a premium visa, which is free, you just apply online and it's given by the EDB. You come to Mauritius, you don't have to worry about anything. And then during the 12 months, if you choose to do anything, you just talk to us and we'll just transfer the visa from premium to resident, uh, fully residential permit in Mauritius. But investment in Mauritius, quite easy. It starts at $30,000 if you're in the ICT sector. Uh, even if it involves your, your equity that you're bringing in, your technology or asset that you're bringing with you is part of the $30,000. But that's, the, that's for the ICT sector. But then uh, if you want to invest in the property sector, as I said, now it's open at about 350 plus 10%, so $385,000. That is the entry point for you to offer your property in Mauritius and a resident permit altogether. Thank you, Vinay. Um, I, I wanted to actually to ask about digital passports as well, but um, uh, like Julia, I've got too many questions and other questions are coming in. Our time, alas, um, is drawing to a conclusion. Um, and therefore, for those in the audience whose questions haven't been answered, do feel free to write to us and uh, we'll forward your questions to um, our distinguished panelists and similarly uh, of course i i think uh, julia would agree with me that um we need to talk about how we're going to uh, have another event about mauritius especially when our covid uh, restrictions allow us to travel there and of course um uh, i understand the edb is also contemplating a visit here which would be welcome and we would be very happy to assist in hosting you here I'd like to repeat my thanks to all of you for your very thorough replies to all the questions. Um, I have always had a personal bias in favor of Mauritius, but I think that the whole audience, which has actually been one of the best audiences we've, we've, we've had, um, uh, and our audience is usually quite good, will, will agree that the investment and financial opportunities for Hong Kong and greater China entrepreneurs in Mauritius are going to continue to uh, grow, especially as we uh, re-emerge out of the COVID situation into some semblance of normality. Uh, thank you all for uh, signing up to this event. Please keep an eye on our website for future events. Let us know if there are other things that you'd like to us to discuss, whether it is about Mauritius, whether it is about Africa investment, or whether it is about anything to do with the Commonwealth. And with those words, may I please now hand the virtual floor back to our distinguished chairman, Julia Charlton, for her concluding remarks. Thank you very much, Andrew. I can really confirm Andrew is a huge fan of Mauritius. And thank you very much to the speakers. You've all been fantastic. So all good things must come to an end, and we need to wrap up now. And I think there's so many exciting pathways and initiatives 
about Mauritius, which have been discussed today, that you know it really does bear um, a, a further event to go into this in more detail. Um, just just to pick out a few highlights, I think the Honourable Mahen Kumar um, Seriton, the Minister of Financial Services and Good Governance, was extremely um, um, erudite about the opportunities for Mauritius um, in Africa. And as he said, the opportunities are boundless. And you know that extends from food security to ecology. And I was very interested to hear also about this new fund product, the variable capital company fund structure. That's that's a great development as well. And Mr. Vinnie Goodyear, Director of the Economic Development Board of Mauritius, thank you so much. Um, you're so knowledgeable and it obviously you're um, private sector as well as government background comes across very strongly in, in how um, cogently you um, can uh, talk about these subjects. And I thought, you know, your emphasis, um, which also was came out in the questions about the dual feature legal structure, where it's a sort of pick and mix of the best elements of the Francophone and the Anglophone systems and uh -huh. how compelling that is as a uh, legal jurisdiction offering to Africa is extremely interesting. And um, Ms. Yoshni Tulsi, thank you so much for your practical insights. I think there's been an enormous amount of friction in the international banking system in recent years, of, often created for good reasons for AML and so on. But some of the things which you've described about um, maintaining the good governance, but also finding ways to make um, international business less cumbersome, um, more dynamic, with less pain points is an extremely compelling offering, both for your own bank, ABC, but also generally for the banking sector in Mauritius. That was extremely interesting. Thank you. Desmond um, from Hong Kong, thank you so much. That's a great perspective from the other side of the world. You're director of Dynasty Wealth. Loved hearing about your grandfather. Sounds like that's a whole book in itself, or maybe it already is. Um, and clearly, you know a lot about the VASP regime, so I was very interested to hear some of the detail of that and about the virtual exhibition center on Metaverse. That is super exciting. So I feel this is all, you know, wonderful, wonderful picture that we've received about Mauritius. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure there'll be the solutions we've heard about and projects which we've heard about um, will be taken up by many who listen to this webinar. So thank you again for being with us today, both to our speakers and to everybody who's joined us online. So thank you again for joining. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care, everybody. Goodbye.